explain all of that. So here's the question. Not a simple one. How does obesity cause cardiovascular disease? I've already shown you that it's not entirely explained by the comorbidities. And so those of us that have been working in this area believe that the key to all of this is ectopic fat uh, deposition. You get fat in the perivascular tissue, you get it in the myocardium and pericardium, you get it in muscle leading to insulin resistance, you get fatty liver, I'm gonna talk about that a little later, you get it in the renal sinus, which tends to lead to renal disease, and you get visceral adiposity, and which produces cytokines that lead to increased inflammation, increased C-reactive protein. So it is all this ectopic fat that's causing the trouble. Now, I, I did grant rounds not too long ago at Johns Hopkins, where they have a huge database of people that they, they still biopsy a lot of people that come in with heart failure. And what they see in obese people with heart failure is they see myocardial steatosis. So there's, there's fat in the heart muscle. And I think that's the reason that they get half fat and half round is it's the, the fat is distributed everywhere. And so there is this, this Venn diagram here. You have obesity, abdominal obesity is worse. You have the coarse elevated CD risk and you have elevated CRP. And the mechanism here is now very well understood. Fat cells are not inert. Fat cells produce cytokines and those cytokines travel to the liver and they stimulate C-reactive protein. If you look at studies that are done like Jupiter, a long time ago, those people were actually mostly obese. The people that have high CRP, it's, they're linked very closely together. Um, we've known for a long time, and I know most of you are well aware of this, that it is really body habitus has a big, big difference. That if you have abdominal obesity, you tend to have much greater risk of cardiovascular disease. A simple uh, paper tape measure ought to be in every clinic, every cardiovascular clinic. It's in our clinic. And we have our nurses measure waist to hip ratio and everybody that comes in. You will see some people, we call this the gynecoid pattern of obesity because it's more common in women, where all the weight is in the hips, buttocks, thighs. It's, it's all down here, pear shape. And they tend to be metabolically healthier. And then you see men that have just a little tummy bulge and their waist to hip ratio is increased and they're metabolically very unhealthy and it is very closely linked. And as I'm going to show you, it is ethnically distributed. So here's, here's the relationship. This is why BMI alone isn't enough information. Look at somebody with a BMI here of about 30. They can have a waist circumference of 85 centimeters or 110 centimeters. That is a really big difference. And in fact, you can go down here and have a BMI of 25 and have a waist circumference of nearly 100. That is not healthy. Those are folks that are very much more, more likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And uh, here's, the, here's the data. This is the CV hazard. Lowest tertile of BMI, but a high waist circumference. Look at the hazard ratio on the far left. In the middle, uh, waste or, or BMI, it's in kind of the mid range, not really even you know the obese range, same thing in the highest tertile. But down here with a BMI of less than 24 and a half, if you have a high waist circumference, you are at risk. And we see this all the time. I take care of a lot of patients that are of South Asian uh, uh, ancestry, uh, you know, immigrants from from India and uh, related countries. And here's what, what you see. A BMI of 30 in white Europeans is equivalent to a BMI of 22.6 in South Asians. And I can't tell how many of these patients I've seen. They come in and their BMI is normal. It's not elevated. Uh, you know, they're of, of South Asian origin and they have this tummy bulge. 
and their HDL is 28, and their triglycerides are 250, and they're hypertensive, and they may already have diabetes, and they're not very old. And so you have to understand that waist circumference, particularly depending on your ethnic origins, can be a very important predictor of risk. And you have to address it. You have to talk to people about this because it is an important comorbidity. So I talked about the relationship of BMI to CRP. So using a cut point of 2.2, what you see here is that once the BMI gets above 30, particularly in women, more than half of women with a BMI greater than 30 have a high CRP and nearly half of men. And so this is clearly an important uh, comorbidity is inflammatory risk. I don't know if you saw the manuscript that uh, Paul Richter and I uh, wrote in the Lancet uh, last year, but you know, we, we, we studied this very carefully and we showed that this residual inflammatory risk, regardless of your LDL cholesterol, is a major driver of cardiovascular risk. Hypertroglyceridemia comes with the territory. And again, uh, a little worse in women than in men, BMI of 30, your odds ratio for having high triglycerides goes up over fivefold. Uh, with men, it's fourfold. And so, again, something we see with high triglycerides. How do we treat high triglycerides? We don't give people drugs. We don't lose weight. You know, the drugs don't work. Um, uh, but, but weight loss does. And I'll show you a little bit of data. I think I included that slide here. Now, Elliot Jocelyn, who founded the Jocelyn Clinic, is a very smart guy. And this is what he said in 1927. He said, with an excess of fat, diabetes begins. And from an excess of fat, diabetics die. Really impressive comment. Almost 100 years ago. And of course, you all know this relationship, how steep the relationship is between BMI and incident diabetes. Uh, it is uncommon to see people at my age who are obese who don't have diabetes. Um, it just takes a little bit of time, but they're insulin resistant. At some point, their pancreas loses the ability to keep up with their insulin resistance. And the next thing you know, they have diabetes. And it's, however, as I will show you, reversible. So the question is, what, what can weight loss do for these people? Well, I'll show you a little bit of data. There's lots more. If you, if you lose weight, your triglycerides plummet. And you can see that the change in triglycerides in milligrams per deciliter, if you can lose 15% of body weight, we're talking about 70 milligrams per deciliter reduction in triglycerides. Very, very steep effect. Even a little bit of weight loss makes some difference, as you can see here. And the question is, can substantial weight loss favorably affect diabetes? So this was kind of fun for me. So one of our bariatric surgeons approached me a number of years ago. He said he wanted to do a randomized controlled trial. He'd never done a randomized controlled trial before. He's a surgeon. Um, and uh, he said, I want to study the effect of bariatric surgery on people who have diabetes on the reversibility of diabetes. And so we designed the study together and I helped him run it. It was, this is the three-year outcome. It's the only study I ever did that I published three times in the New England Journal. We published the one year, the three year, and the five year results. Doing the girls took all three papers uh, because they thought it was important. It's only 150 patients. And for the young people here, just keep in mind you don't have to study a large group of people to, to have insight. That study of nitric oxide was 25 people, done by one of our fellows. Okay. So uh, this was 150 patients. I'll show you the design in a minute. And here's what we did we had an endocrinologist very good, manage uh, a third of the patients, 50, with intensive medical care. I mean, saw these patients frequently, gave them the best treatment for diabetes, tried to get them to lose weight, ruin Y bypass, 
in 50 and sleeve gastrectomy in 50. And then we followed them out for five years. Uh, we published initially the primary endpoint was at 12 months. The question is, what would happen? And here's what happened to their hemoglobin A1C. It went down almost 3%. 3% means if you start out at, at eight and a half, you end up at five and a half. It was remarkable. We got some initial benefit from medical therapy, but by the end of 36 months, it was pretty small, the benefit of medical therapy. This is the number of diabetes medications. And what you see is with the gastric bypass patients, they were on 0.5 beds, meaning that they were typically on, you know, gram metformin a day. And they had normal hemolymphosis. Most of them, the diabetes disappeared. We did bariatric surgery. We showed in this small study. When the journal understood the importance and they published it, that you can reverse diabetes with weight loss. Now it takes a fair amount of weight loss, but you can absolutely, these people, a lot of them, over half of them were on insulin and they came off insulin. It's a remarkable finding. And it's important to recognize this when you see these patients, what can be accomplished if you can get them to lose weight. Well, what about diet or conventional drug therapy? I mean, you know, we can't do bariatric surgery in a, in a billion people with obesity. You know, we can do it in a few hundred thousand in, the, in a rich country like the United States, but it isn't the global solution to the problem. And it has its own downsides, as I think I'll, as I'll show you in a minute. So this was the look ahead trial. Now, the NIH invested more money in this trial than any trial that they have ever done. It was $100 million. $100 million taxpayer money, 10-year trial. And what they did was they saw these people frequently. They had coaches, they had dietitians, they had physiologists. They gave them the most intensive lifestyle alteration for weight loss you can imagine. And they got a net effect of a four kilogram weight loss over, over 10 years, four kilograms. That's all they got. And the main outcome was cardiovascular disease. And as many of you know the literature, know what happened. Nothing happened. You know, $100 million down the drain, hazard ratio 0.95, p-value 0.51, you don't get any more neutral than that. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that you could sit down with your patients and, and you can counsel them on weight loss. And they'll, so occasionally they'll be successful, but it doesn't work for the masses. It isn't, it's a disease that you can't modify very easily with lifestyle. And then the sad history of drugs. And several of these were trials I did. Um, amphetamines are just awful. You know, high abuse potential, hypertension. Benfluramine, fatal pulmonary hypertension. Fenfen, valvular heart disease, withdrawn. Cybutramine was withdrawn for increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. It was a terrible outcome. Uh, Orlistat, I didn't want to talk about anal you know, leak leakage. You know, that's not <laughs> that not very pleasant. Uh, Ramonabot, I did one of the Ramonabot studies and it was withdrawn, got approved in Europe and withdrawn because people were killing themselves. Uh, Lorcasserin Lor actually got approved and was withdrawn because it caused malignancy. And I did the uh, bupropion naltrexone study and it showed no benefit and they didn't lose very much weight. So the question is, We've shown already, now we showed, you know, during the last decade, we showed that bariatric surgery could reduce first diabetes. But can it reduce cardiovascular disease? That is a important question. Not just diabetes, but cardiovascular disease. So I linked up with another of our bariatric surgeons who was a successor to the prior bariatric surgeon. We, we did a study, now it is an observational study, and I will tell you, I don't do very many observations. <laughs> you know, I'm an RCT guy, but there, 
we couldn't do a large RCP very interesting. We just we tried, we tried to get the NIH to fund it, they wouldn't do it. And so we did this study, and it was the most carefully matched study we could do. We took people referred for bariatric surgery, and those in who we got the insurance company to cover it, got bariatric surgery, but a bunch of them were very, very nicely matched, inverse probability weighting and Cox proportional hazards modeling. So we had as closely matched a group of people, as you can imagine, who didn't get bariatric surgery matched with those that did. And we published this in JAMA, Aliyah Minion and I, uh, several years ago, I think it was 2019. And here's what happened. We got uh, a pretty robust weight loss. You know, it was, you know, around 20%. And we got, a, as you would expect, a very nice reduction in hemoglobin A1C. Okay, that's not a surprise. But here's what happened. We defined as a primary endpoint six component phase and sure all the components. And look, I do a lot of clinical trials. When you see a hazard ratio of 0.61, even if our observational study was wrong by large margin, that's a 39% reduction. In morbidity and mortality. If you look at just three component makes gap, stroke, MI, it's a 38% reduction. Look at how quickly you notice that there's an early hazard, but then rapidly the Kaplan Meyer occurs separate. Let me show you more about this study that we did. All cause mortality, 41% reduction, enormous. Heart failure, biggest difference. It was, uh, it was a 62% reduction in the risk of heart failure. Just incredible. Coronary disease, 31% reduction. Stroke, cerebrovascular disease, 33% reduction. Nephropathy. This includes end stage renal disease, all kinds of you know, bad renal outcomes, 60% reduction. And atrial fibrillation, a 22% reduction. However, I will be the first to tell you, we did this in part because we wanted to, to see whether the morbidity, the cardiovascular or related morbidities due to obesity could be reversed. But in the years after metabolic surgery, some people end up on TPN, half of them had endoscopy, interventional radiology procedures, repeat abdominal surgical procedures, abdominal wall hernia, and cholecystectomies. They had a lot of downstream adverse effects. It's not something to be considered lightly, but for somebody that's a really high risk, BMI is approaching 40. And you know, this is something I think, yeah, I don't know if you have a big bariatric surgical program here or not, but it is something that cardiologists, I send patients that I see, to our bariatric surgeons, because I believe that we can reduce their morbidity substantially if they're willing to accept that there are some consequences. Now, we also did something. At the time they had bariatric surgery, surgery our surgeons under direct vision from the, from the endoscopic procedure, uh, they did a direct liver biopsy. So we have liver biopsies in everybody that had bariatric surgery. Because as I think, I hope you know, uh, it is a really big problem, fatty liver disease. And this is what it looks like. Uh, that's what a fatty liver looks like. And it progresses to non-alcoholic status. You can see the cellular infiltrated panel B, then cirrhosis, and then either transplant or death. And this problem is, really increasing at an alarming rate. It used to be that hepatitis C was the, re was the leading cause for liver transplantation, but it's now between alcoholic liver disease and NASH cirrhosis, they're competing for the leading cause of liver failure and transplantation. And this disease is everywhere. And by the way, if you see an obese patient and they have elevated liver enzymes, watch out. You know, I, am a, I have a whole lecture about how to manage those patients. But here's what we did. 
we looked at, again, very carefully matched controls for carriage surgical patients. Now, I've never seen a hazard ratio of 0.12. You can see what happens is that progression to major liver, adverse liver outcomes, cirrhosis, transplantation, or liver-related death goes up over the next decade, and a metabolic surgery patients virtually have none of it. Hazard ratio 0.12 is an 88% reduction in the risk of these adverse liver outcomes. So fatty liver disease in patients with obesity can be reversed. So then the question is, can newer pharmacological therapies achieve uh, the weight loss offered by a bariatric surgeon? And as you might know, there's now, it's now the, the drug of the, of the decade is semaglutide can produce dose dependent reductions in body weight. You, you need to give a lot. The 2.4 milligram dose is required, but you can see here about a 10% weight loss in this you know, very typical study of semaglutide uh, in a uh, weight. Okay. GLP-1 agonists do in fact achieve substantial weight loss. Not as much as bariatric surgery yet, but it's coming. And it's also important to understand that there are three increases. And cardiologists should understand the increases. GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon receptors. And you can design multifunctional peptides that can be agonists, or in some cases antagonists, for any of those three ingredients. And you can do it in a single molecule. And basically what you do is you create a hybrid. And so the question is, what about dual or triple uh, uh, agonists? And what you have to understand is that these incretin receptors are not just in the pancreas, but they're in the heart, they're in adipose tissue, liver, intestines, and even the brain. And it turns out the brain is the target because when you give GLP-1 agonists, you're turning off this drive to overeat. And that's because the receptors are everywhere. Now, here's how it works. Uh, here are the peptides and you can create a balanced hybrid where you're an agonist for all three incretins or an unbal imbalanced hybrid. And we've been in very interested in this for a long time. And as you're going to show you, we're studying. So terzepatide is the first of the dual agonists. And it was recently approved for obesity. It's been approved for a couple of years now for diabetes. It's a multifunctional peptide. It is more active at GIP than GLP. Think of it as a dual agonist. It's GIP stronger than GLP. Half-life of five days, which means you can give it, uh, you can give it once a week, just like semaglutide. And by the way, I prescribe these drugs, and you should be comfortable. Cardiologists should be comfortable with prescribing these kinds of drugs for our patients. This is our disease. Don't send them to endocrinology. Take care of them. Learn to use these drugs. It's, like, it's easy. It's very, very easy, and you ought to be able to do it. Well, this is what happened. When trisepidine was studied over 72 weeks, the mean weight loss was 22, median weight loss was 22.5%. That's in the same range as urine wide gastric bypass. So it's twice the weight loss seen with some semaglutide. And that's at the top dose of 15 milligrams, which by the way, is actually better tolerated than some of the And so what about triple agonists? What if you, what if you agonize all three receptors? And for those of you who read the New England Journal, you know that rutatrotide has now been studied. It's heading toward approval. It's going to be on the market for the next year or two. It's, again, it's a GLP, GLP, and glucagon agonist. It's most potent at GIP. It's six day half life. And it was studied in a 48 week, almost a year, phase two trial. So this is just 48 weeks. And the median weight loss was 24.2%. 
at the top goes, and it's still going down. It is just uh, incredibly effective. Uh, it's not available yet, but it's going to be available very soon. We are on the verge of a turning point in the ability to treat this epidemic. Unfortunately, these drugs are expensive. That's the biggest downside, but they work. In female patients, there seems to be, for all of these drugs, a bigger effect. 28.5% median weight loss in women. You know, somebody who's, who's, you know, 250 pounds, you know, they, they end up being close to normal body weight when you, when you give them a drug like protector diet. Well, can we, can we come up with an oral drug that does this? And so, but yeah, if you read it in the journal, Last year, or for Glipron, it's a non-peptide GLP-1 agonist, and it's being developed. It was studied. It's a partial agonist for GLP-1 receptors. It's got a half-life sufficient to be given once a day, so it's 29 to 49 hours given orally, and was studied only a 36-week trial. But here's an oral drug, people with a mean BMI of 37.9, got a 14.7% weight loss, and it's still going down with this drug. One once a day pill that does what these injectable agents do, and it's coming. It's going to be approved within a couple of years. Well, can these drugs do what we saw in our observational study with bariatric surgery? Important question answered by a study. It was not a study that we did at C5 Research, our, our clinical trial center, but the PI was my colleague, Mike Linkoff. Uh, no one artist does not do academic trials. They come into my trials. And it was called SELECT. Um, many of you saw it. Semaglutide, given over a period of about 48 months, 20% reduction in CV death, non-fatal stroke, or myocardial infarction. Uh, landmark study, basically showing that you can do this with a, for the first time in history, with a pharmacological issue. Not one that's gonna be withdrawn for adverse effects, but one that actually is quite safe. And although they didn't handle this well in the trial design, because there's no p-value, because there wasn't, probably uh, linked in the hierarchical testicle procedure. But here is the, the uh, all-cause mortality effect. Uh, hazard ratio of 0.81 with an upper confidence interval of 0.9. So all-cause mortality was decreased in obese patients who didn't have diabetes with some of the So really, really incredible. Well, the water doctor is epitaph. You got a more powerful agent. So, what can we do in these patients that are not diabetic? Uh, and we're doing this trial, I'm the study chair for the trial. We're studying select was only secondary prevention. There's people that already had a had an event. We're studying both primary and secondary prevention in the terzepatite study. And here are our endpoints. It's called surmount MMO, and it's all cause mortality, non fatal MI, non fatal stroke, coronary revascularization, and heart failure events. We're going to look at all these endpoints in a composite, and we're going to look at them individually as well. We didn't do just the narrow endpoint, we took all the things that we think are going to be impacted, and we put them into the primary endpoint. Now, Brown and Goldstein, who were very smart, I know. Maybe you met, met them. I, 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 Michael Brown's quite a character. If you hear about this guy. In 1996, they got the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor. And they wrote an article in Science, a prestigious journal, saying heart attacks are going to be gone at the turn of the century. Well, you know, they thought if you could just control LDL cholesterol, heart attacks would go away. I don't think they understood the power of the contemporary uh, Western diet. Uh, that they didn't understand the obesity epidemic that was already coming at this point in time. So I searched the world to find 
the world's most Catholic food. And I found it in Scotland. For those of you who've been there in Scotland, you can fry everything. And I want to show you, you know, what Brown and Goldstein didn't anticipate. This is a deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> you take, uh, it's the world's most Catholic food. It's deep, deep, deep. You take the Mars bar, you batter it, and then you deep flat fry it. It comes out as a nice, warm, kind of gooey mess. You eat it. It goes straight to the left main corner <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> well, in age of Scotland, we got our own, okay? Now their sign says billions and billions serve, okay? Driving our obesity epidemic. Let me just show you how bad it is. This is the, uh, the Big Mac fries and Coke. It's 1,360 calories, about what I eat in a day, okay? And it has 57 grams of fat. It has 84 grams of sugar, which is 168% of the recommended daily allowance. It is an incredible, an absolutely incredibly atherogenic meal, and it's being consumed every single day. So let me sum summarize. Obesity increases rates of coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, atrial fibrillation, and all cause mortality. It is abdominal obesity, waist circumference that is more closely linked to adverse outcomes than BMI, even in physically fit and metabolically healthy obese patients. The mechanism of harm includes glucose intolerance, hypertension, inflammation as measured by CRP or IL-6, increased triglycerides, and low HDL. Substantial weight loss with bariatric surgery has been linked to reduce cardiovascular risk and is now potentially achievable with pharmacological therapies. My message to you is I'm learning to treat this disease. It's a cardiovascular disease. We have medications now that we can administer. We should manage these patients. You should manage these patients. Keep a tape measure in. Find these patients. Get them on a trajectory that's going to protect them from the consequences, which are going to be found in the cat lab and in the CC. And we need to own this. Thank you very much for your time. We have a little time for questions. Nick, uh, that was a lecture I enjoyed the most in years, I think. Really Thank you very much. Um, I'm a heart failure doctor. I treat uh, ejection fraction flow, goes up, patients ask me, can I stop the medication? And I would say, no, you can't. And so this question, of course, is discussed uh, with uh, these weight loss drugs. What's your take on that? Yeah, uh, so here's my, my thing, first of all. I agree with what you said, okay? <laughs> if you have somebody that has uh, hypercholesterolemia, you put them on a staff and their LDL goes down, you take away the staff, no. Uh, if you have a hypertension and you lower the blood pressure, it goes down. You take away the hypertension, and you say the same. You're saying the same thing. So it is. It is lifelong treatment. I think we may be entering an era when we will have reduction therapy and maintenance therapy. You might induce with a drug like terzepatide or rutatrutide, and then maybe switch to or 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 lipron, you know, oral drug. And sooner or later, by the way, you know, within the careers of our particularly our younger people. These drugs are going to be generic. They're not going to cost what they cost now. And insurers are beginning, now that we have evidence that in non-diabetic obese patients, we can reduce morbidity and mortality, we're going to get these drugs paid for. But I do think that there, we need to study the possibility of induction therapy and then maintenance therapy as a potential way to Other questions? So thank you for the great talk. Um, as you all know, in, in the U.S. and beyond, the unhelpful dietary pattern is the norm. Not yeah. Yes, it is. And so we're facing it's a societal level issue. We're obviously facing multiple headwinds. Yes. Uh, for example, the farm bill subsidizing animal aggregates is oh. of billions of dollars. Um, multiple headwinds. People are trying to nibble at the edges, but. Can you give us over your thoughts on how we may bend the curve on a societal level to help make a more helpful diet a bit more of the norm? Yeah. 
I, I think we have to get into the schools because this starts in childhood. You know, um, every now and then when I'm traveling, you know, I will stop to get a Diet Coke out of McDonald's. And if you ever go in those places, I hope most of you don't, uh, look around, okay? And what you see is a teenager there with a bulging belly uh, that clearly is on a trajectory towards a reduced lifespan and horrible morbidity, you know, diabetes and cardiac disease and so on. I think get into schools, we teach about nutrition. Uh, we try to do some things to encourage physical fitness. You know, a lot of schools have eliminated physical education. That's one of the big trends now is they don't have PE. When I was a kid, we all went out to PE. So I think there are things that we can do. Uh, I wish it were simple, but it's not simple. But I think we got to get to people earlier in life. That would be the most important thing to do. And it may not work. You know, here's what's going on. We evolved as a species. Uh, having food shortages. You know, our ancient ancestors in Africa, you know, they ate off the land, food was not plentiful, and they learned that our bodies adapted to store fat. Because if you could store some fat, you could get through those periods where you didn't have access to food. And so we are programmed to store fat. Now food is plentiful and it's high in calories and we're programmed. And, you know, we've seen this in the Pima Indians and there are other places where they, they just eat them almost any excess in calories and they store it as fat. So it is a problem biologically for our species. Yes. Hi. I'm Jerry Lecho, very much. Uh, you talked a little bit about this, but uh, for a topic part, we can image this topic part. Yes, for, for example, with, with CT, we have yes. done some work yes. on the tissue. And That's these right. drugs can modulate that part. That's well. right. Do you think that we can use uh, that or, or guide with imaging the, the treatment of, of those patients that are not, uh, not only in, in physical like, uh, parameters of obesity, just use mm -hmm. imaging to guide? The, the treatment. Well, I do think there's some potential there. Uh, it's certainly for identification of people that are at greater risk. And you know, you're quite right. You can you can image the, this uh, now with, with contemporary imaging techniques. I think it's something to be explored. It's got to be studied. Probably should be studied in a randomized, controlled way. But if you can do that, I think you may be able to show that there's a potential benefit. So I'm open to that idea. Yeah, you have the in the game that we talk. Um, one of the major problems we have in medicine in general is yeah. compliance and communication. Oh. Oh. So, I mean, if, if I look at what's the compliance of uh, anticoagulation in patients with child vascular four, you always see, you know, people that are non-compliant. Yeah. Despite the fact that they know they might have a stroke. Yeah. So, with this, one of the reasons why I like the bariatric surgery is because the therapy. You know, it's the best compliant, but yeah. you show us possible, you know, side effect that comes. So, do you have data about, you know, the non-compliant medication and the long-term side effect of this medication? So here, well, here's what we know. Okay, people love these drugs because they see the results. See, the problem with anticoagulation is you don't see anything, you don't feel any different. Okay, here, people become more active. They are happier. Uh, there's an increased improvement in mood, and they see their, their weight coming off. People who are obese are depressed. They have uh, bad self-image. Uh, there are all kinds of psychological effects, and those go away when they lose weight. Um, I'll tell you just an anecdote. There's somebody I, I, I'm working with on the Terzepatite study. He's one of the key people at Eli Lilly that I work with on trial. And she was very obese, morbidly obese. And when the trial started, she was a pain in the ass. I mean, <laughs> just, you know, I mean, I work, I can work with anybody, but she was terrible. And then she got her zephyrite. And she got it for free. And she worked for Eli Lilly. And she, she started it. And she lost maybe 100 pounds. 
and she's now one of the most pleasant people. <laughs> and honestly, her whole personality changed. And so the reason compliance is high here is people like the way they feel when they lose all this weight. And so it's not a problem. And that little, that little pen you put up your skin once a week, it's pretty easy. Uh, you mentioned a little bit uh, how BMI of 25 was rich and uh, acid. Yeah. Uh, person would almost equivalent to somebody with a heavy BMI, right? right? Which is a concussion, maybe. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So that really can show us that uh, that the genetic ancestry may play a role. Yes. And, and, and what are uh, your thoughts about including the genetic scores or risks to? Uh, Target that with these well, it's an interesting idea. It hasn't been well studied. You know, at, as you know, in cardiovascular disease, and we're working in this area as well, polygenic risk scores are really interesting. But we haven't done that here, and we probably should. Uh, I still think that the phenotype is helpful. That waist to hip ratio turns out to be really powerful, and it's so easy to measure. You know, and I, I assume most of you have seen people. South Asian ancestry with that little tummy bulge and a really low HDL. And, you know, you know what's coming. And if we can somehow intervene, we can make a difference in the future. Yes. Thanks so much for the incredible lecture. Uh, I was uh, curious about, you know, you, you point out very quickly how obesity clearly are related to evidence of your risk. Uh, but how much does diet impact that in terms of, let's say you have somebody who eats steak and hamburger every single day, but they don't have a caloric access, right? Yeah. They are maybe 1,400 calories a day, and uh, as a result of the amount of uh, somebody who eats a vegan diet, you know, only the, the cleanest healthy food, but they eat 3,000 calories a day. Um, how do you balance it? So um, we have a little data here. I, I'm going to tell you that I have a relatively negative view of the impact of diet here. Um, I know it's very popular now to have these, you know, vegan, you know, plant-based diets and so on. And you do lower LDL, you know, 10% or so when you shift from the bad diet to the good diet. But, you know, we can do five milligrams of a suicide and lower LDL by 40%. So the best data is from the Predimet study. And the Predimet study is a little bit a little bit dirty, as you know, they had to do a, a retraction correction on that study because of the way they handled the, the study. But it did show in primary prevention that the Mediterranean diet was associated with lower risk. What I tell people is that the healthiest diet that we have evidence for is Mediterranean diet. We have an RCP. We don't have an RCP for this, this trend now in plant-based diets. It's not an RCP. And so I think somebody's got to do an RCP and find out. And maybe it's great, maybe it's not, but I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because what basically diet does is it has an effect. If you eat a lot of salt, your blood pressure goes up. And if you eat a lot of fat, your LDL goes up a little bit. But not so I just wanted to comment. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, they're all laughing. Well, you know, I had like a plant-based diet. <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right. There's way more evidence for the Mediterranean style yeah. diet, which in truth is largely yeah. a plant-based diet. Yeah. And nobody thinks a plant-based diet is going to make people bulletproof. But it's just yeah. one piece of a larger puzzle yeah. diet to help improve health. Yeah. And compared to Mediterranean style diet, this is still quite speculative. But there are a couple of smaller randomized trials, 100. Uh, people, different people in different outcomes, where there are the surrogate endpoints like LDL, et cetera, fall more on a plant based, healthy plant based versus a Mediterranean, liver fat falls more on the green Mediterranean diet. But these are small yeah. randomized trials. So 0.7% of the US consumes a healthy dietary pattern. <laughs> yeah. and so people that you know far better than I can argue which is the super most greatest diet. But we're so many miles away from that that every step in that direction is important. And one randomized trial by Dr. Jenkins showed that uh, a, a high fiber plant based diet can lower LDL cholesterol about the same as 20 milligrams of uh, metal. So, Steve, uh, yeah. 
I'm going to a wedding on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my cousin, she's uh, has a BMI of 24. Yeah. But she wanted to uh, go to her daughter's wedding. Yeah. On a dress that she wore 20 years ago, where her BMI was close to 18. Yeah. So she got herself in Osemite. Oh, that's bad. Um, I, I take you after here to a tour of our emergency room, so you can find how many patients have a BMI of 24 there, probably zero. <laughs> um, I'm sure that everybody here has tried to prescribe Ozempic or Mujaro on our patients, and it's very, very, very difficult to get that. So we are here in the Bronx, by the way, the highest BMI county in the New York area, is that right? The lowest socioeconomic income. Yes. So there is yeah. a it's completely a inverse relationship. And you're right, you go around and you'll find McDonald's and things like that. Whereas the vegan restaurants are in Manhattan and you know, yeah. it's uh, you know, more, more, more difficult to afford. So uh, I think, you know, don't you think that this is a matter that definitely should be a priority for the government to correct? It should be, look. If you add up the cost, I didn't put the slides in, but I have slides here on the cost of obesity in hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. We could treat a lot of people with obesity. If we had $10 billion, let's say, invested in treating this disorder, you could treat a lot of people, even at the current pricing of the drugs. And I think the government should be allowed to negotiate pricing with, with the pharmaceutical industry, which is, as you know, is something that's very hard to accomplish. So we can get the prices down to something that could be afforded. And I think that would be a great investment by the government. Now, unfortunately in Hollywood, uh, semaglutide is very popular. You know, actors and actresses that wanna look good in movies and television are getting this drug these drugs and poor people who are morbidly obese can't get them and it's a problem and we have to deal with it it's a political problem and it means we got to engage in the political and i am engaged in the political sphere as you probably know you know one last question do we get to that point of you're successful politically yeah, yeah. made that change yeah. um so we try performing but that's the thing of the past it doesn't really do very much I will tell you what I have do, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this because what I'm going to say, FDA says no to, okay? There are two approaches that you can use. There are very ethical Canadian pharmacies where you can get semaglutide uh, orally, oral semaglutide, which is a drug here known as Rebelsis, for about one third the cost in the United States. And it's the same drug in the same packaging from the same company, no one hurts. You can get it for your patients. And then there are compounding form, form, formulations where you, they actually can get some glutide, they can compound it. I don't know if you guys know about this. And then they deliver it in a vial to patients, a little syringe with a small needle, and they can self-inject. And it's about one fifth of the cost of some of glutide uh, prescribed uh, appropriately. Now, FDA is is against this, and so I'm, you know, obviously saying something I shouldn't be saying. But patients come first. Um, I'm going to have to stop here. You guys are going to be meeting with Dr. Mason in the fellowship, so we can continue with some of these questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize that you were in the So, so, so it turns out the relevance of the, of the talk is it's very And look at the price of it. 
and they basically are compounding it and delivering it to patients, not in the in the normal artist kind but in the bio applications and stuff. So it's about it's seven thousand dollars. It's about a hundred dollars. I think that's going to be a big challenge, right, for the compliance for the medications. I don't see it. People are so pleased, you know, that with the with the weight loss therapy, that they're that they just they would be the last thing in the world they want to and if you give it in the, in the form that it comes to express the penalty, you look at the penalty injections. It's like a 29 gauge beetle spring loaded. Put it up, you know, put it on your abdomen. And it's done. You're going to die. So instead of follow up and saying, the question, not my time. Yeah, you're getting your piece of that. You know what? It doesn't matter what that is. And what if it's going to happen? Which is very possible. Usually, if you start, their weight goes back up. Weight goes back up. It takes a while. Yeah. Now, I have had people go off drug and and stay more slender. I mean, very disciplined. I don't know. And they will do maybe part of the weight back, but not all. Uh, and that's why I think there may be a, a strategy here for a bait. It's very, very short. Yeah. 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 of course, is really strongly linked to it. Oh, no. Oh. This is a McDonald's movie that was made here in New York about. There was a guy who, for six weeks, only ate McDonald's, nothing else. And his, his liver ends up. Uh, I used to like Big Mac. I have from the day I saw the movie, I'm not very impressed by like that. I've never eaten uh, fast food. Super size me. A New York cardiologist made that movie. You can see these liver biopsies that you get during bariatric surgery. You see the liver globulin 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 Okay. Oh, I'm 